Right, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Thomas Lindsay and Mari Margill from the um, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund in the USA. We'll be talking about their work both in the USA and all around the world. So I shall hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, our task is to very briefly give you a sense of what is happening in different parts of the world in terms of advancing rights of nature legal frameworks. Our organization, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, uh, began working in the United States um, about 15 years ago um, on just helping communities to fight threats to the natural environment. And what we learned during the course of our organizing is that our environmental laws don't protect the environment. What? <laughs> <laughs> the end. <laughs> You might be surprised, but in the United States, when we say that, many people gasp. Um, and so that is not very well known, perhaps outside of this room. But we wanted to quickly let you know, in the United States, we began work as a nonprofit public interest law firm with the intention of helping communities fight threats to the natural environment. We quickly learned that our environmental legal system was absolutely not written or developed for the purpose of protecting the environment. And so rapidly we realized we needed to very much change the way that we did our work. And we knew that by going to our state governments or the United States Congress, we would find no help there. We found that our Congress and, the United, and our state legislatures are very much in the business of writing laws to make sure that our communities get fracked, drilled, mined, they get their water privatized, or privatized and so on. And so what our communities and what we learned as an organization was that if we were to make real fundamental change, that we had to begin at the grassroots in our communities. So to tell a very long story short, we have now um, worked with over 150 communities in the United States to put in place what we call community and nature's rights laws. They establish that the communities have the right to self-determination, that is, they get to decide what their energy future looks like. And at the same time, establishing those rights means having to ban those activities which would violate the community's right to self-determination and which would violate the community's right and the rights of nature. So we have um, communities that have banned fracking. We have communities that have banned mining. We have communities that have banned the privatization of their water. But it's not just enough for them simply to ban something they do not want. They also have to put in place a structure of law at the local level to define what they do want. And that means establishing community rights to self-governance as well as the rights of nature. The first rights of nature law in the United States was adopted by a local municipality called Tamaqua Borough in the year 2006. We now have over three dozen communities, local municipalities in the United States, which have put rights of nature into law, the very first rights of nature laws in the United States. The largest place to have done that is the city of Pittsburgh in the state of Pennsylvania with 300,000 people. And we're ta talking about how do we enforce those laws to protect even outside of the city, like upstream with rivers that are coming into the city that are polluted and so on. The point is, is that in the United States, our model for social change is that we must build up from the grassroots to begin driving change up from the local level next to our state levels and then to our federal level. And so we're now beginning to bring together communities within states to create state networks, as well as at the national level to create a national community and nature's right network, which is in the business now of actually driving into our state constitutions and eventually our federal US constitution, community rights and nature's rights. We don't believe that without building from the grassroots that we can actually make the structural change that we need to in order to actually protect the environment and actually have self-determination. In our mind, self-determination and the protection of nature go hand in hand. They go together absolutely and necessarily, and our communities agree with this. So in the United States, this is the work that we have done. We were then invited to Ecuador in 2007 and 2008 during the Constitution drafting process 
and talked about rights of nature when we went to Monte Cristo with the different mesas that were drafting different parts of the Constitution and told our stories of our communities in the United States about rights of nature. You heard about what's happened in Ecuador and how it was ratified into the Constitution in 2008. What happened next, outside of Ecuador, it helped to bring a lot of attention to what rights of nature is. So we began to receive phone calls from places like Nepal. Nepal has in a, been a constitution drafting process for a number of years now. They just elected a new constitutional assembly. We met with them two years ago. We'll likely be meeting with them later this year to talk about how do they actually bring rights of nature, just like Ecuador, bring it into their constitution. And in Nepal, as you may know, with the Himalaya melting, climate change is a major, major issue. The water that comes out of the Himalaya feeds the country. And so we've been talking with them about not only establishing rights of nature, but also establishing a right to climate, that the climate itself has rights, and that people and ecosystems on the ground have the right to a healthy climate, creating a fundamentally new paradigm for protection under climate change. We could go into more detail, and we will have some time for Q&A, but I wanted to move a little bit um, further, which is to say that we've heard, we've been meeting with people in Italy, we've talked with people in Tunisia, we've talked with people in Kenya, Northern Ireland, Scotland, different parts of the UK, different parts of Europe, um, as well as places in Mexico, as well as Canada. There was a great deal of interest in what it would mean to fundamentally change their existing structures for how environmental laws work, because they work the same way everywhere around the world. That they treat nature as property, and that they regulate the use of nature. That is, our environmental laws legally authorize the exploitation of ecosystems. It's the same everywhere. And there's a growing understanding in my mind, and perhaps yours as well, that without fundamental systems change, we cannot protect the natural environment. And so the rights of nature is that fundamental change. We're now working in addition to Nepal, um, we've been working in India. And I know that you recently met with some of the folks that we're working with um, at Ganga Action Paravar who were working with to draft a National Ganga Rights River Act, a protection, a national, excuse me, let me say that again, a National uh, Ganga River Rights Act to recognize rights of the Ganga River, its tributaries, and entire watershed. Because there's an understanding that the Holy River, the Ganga River, is the kind of protection that it has now is not sufficient. And that as a national symbol all around the world, that it fundamentally needs to change the way that it is protected. And recognizing the right of the Ganga River, the slogan for the campaign is, Ganga's rights are our rights. There's an understanding of the interdependence of the human communities and the natural communities around that river and the watershed, and that they need to drive a structurally different kind of protection in order to protect that river and the people and human communities around it. So that work has been continuing. We began working with them in 2012. Um, in a little bit, uh, Michelle Maloney will speak to us from Australia, where we had the opportunity to go in uh, September of this past year to talk with people and communities in that country, as that they are seeing, Michelle will share with us, that the extraction industry there is unfortunately booming. And there's an understanding that their national government is not going to help them protect their lands and their farms and their rivers and their streams. And that's something fundamentally new needs to happen. And so talking about how do we bring rights of nature frameworks into Australia. Uh, I know we'll also have Pablo speak to us about what's happened in Bolivia to talk about the law of Mother Earth there and what that has looked like. But all to say, we are receiving calls all the time from people in different parts of the world that are learning about what happened here in Ecuador, that are hearing about what's happened in the United States, that are hearing about what's happened in Australia, and so on, who are saying something fundamentally different needs to happen. And this rights of nature framework, I think, um, taking the lessons from the United States and from Ecuador, is really, I think, helping to drive forward a shift, not only legally, but culturally, um, which is how we see a social movement needing to build, not only in our own country, but in all over the world. So just to say a couple minutes about the United States uh, organizing, uh, to add to what Mari had just mentioned. The, the, the fact is in the United States right now, in the States, there's a mini revolt taking place. 
And it, it's a revolt over community self-determination, the fact that communities don't have it, whether it's indigenous or non-indigenous. If a municipality, a community in the United States doesn't want to be fracked, they have no legal authority to say no. Our communities are seizing that authority to say no. In addition to saying no, they're also saying to the national and state governments that you don't have the power to override us. We're actually going to nullify your ability to force fracking or oil and gas extraction into our community. In addition to that, they're advancing a rights of nature framework. It says we're not the only ones with community self-determination, but we're beginning to redefine the word community to mean both the human community and the natural community. That rivers and forests have a right to self-determine just as much as people within those communities have a right to self-determine. As Mari mentioned, those communities in various states, eight to be exact, within the 50 states within the United States, now have a critical mass of communities who have come together to do collective lawmaking to actually be part of this mini revolt about throwing off these power bases, the corporate power base and the governmental power base, to actually come together at the state level to begin proposing amendments to their state constitutions. <laughs> Those amendments to the state constitutions include rights of nature provisions. Later this year, those eight states are coming together to propose federal constitutional amendments that change the national constitution of the United States to actually drive rights of nature into place as well as community self-determination issues. So that's what's happening in the states right now in terms of moving that change from the grassroots up to the upper levels. The rights of nature stuff goes hand in hand with the community self-determination material. It's not just a rights of nature movement. It's about community self-determination. The rights of nature are built into that. It's seen as one, one thing, one subject. The final piece to talk about before we, we uh, stop talking uh, is the piece about if you're in a locality or a community in the United States that doesn't have your elected officials who are willing to actually partake in this local revolt, or you don't have enough people to make law within the community, that we've pioneered a new form of private land easements. In other words, uh, deed restrictions or deed easements that individual property owners can use to create rights of nature on their property. Okay? So these are places that can't move laws yet, but you have individual landowners who want to create rights of nature frameworks on their properties. So we pioneered these uh, two years ago, actually came in response to uh, an Ecuadorian uh, who asked us about creating private rights of nature on their property. And so we pioneered those easement agreements. They're now being entered into by landowners in the United States. Part of the leverage position there is if you get enough landowners within a community who actually put rights of nature on their property as a, as a legal system within those deed restrictions or deed easements, that it leverages the power within those communities to start pushing the lawmaking as well. So again, in the United States, all these different tools, all these vehicles that we're using to try to push from the grassroots up, in essence, to destabilize the property-based system that's higher up. Because the communities understand that it's not, it's not just a brand new idea that they're trying to move forward. You have to dismantle the existing system that allowed the project to take place in the first instance. That means taking corporate rights away. It means taking preemptive rights away. It means actually destabilizing that system so that you can drive the new law into place. That's the new vision in the states, at least, uh, that we're starting to see in other places where we've worked, uh, like Nepal and in Australia, where communities are doing that work as well. So that's it. Uh, and I realize I didn't explain our role within the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, which is this work that um, we're doing, the Global Alliance has a working group called the Legal Assistance Working Group. And that's, we head up that working group in order to work with different communities, um, non-governmental organizations, civil society, as well as governments in different parts of the world that are interested in advancing rights of nature frameworks. And so that's the role that we play within the Global Alliance. Thank you. And one, one final thing is about litigation. There's been several lawsuits brought by the state government and by private entities against these communities that are trying to drive rights of nature in the states. A lot of those are still active right now. We don't shirk from those. We welcome them because the work is about drawing those confrontations because without the confrontations and without the struggle, people don't understand how the system actually functions adversely to the rights of nature. 
So our job as we see it is to provoke a thousand different confrontations so people can begin to understand the difference between how the system currently works and how the system needs to work. And the final piece is, Mari mentioned that the city of Pittsburgh is the largest municipality that unanimously adopted rights of nature law within the city of Pittsburgh, unanimously through their elected officials. The rivers within the city of Pittsburgh, the Monongahela and the Yakagani, all have rights within the city of Pittsburgh at this point. We've been exploring with them bringing the first rights of nature lawsuit in the United States to actually use the municipality to sue upstream oil and gas extraction interests for violating the rights of the river as it flows through the city of Pittsburgh. It would be the first really big litigation action in the United States, at least enforcing the rights of nature. So it's been a while getting here, but we had to change out the old mayor. We had to put a couple new folks in uh, to actually begin to move that. We hope that moves this year.